A mass spectrometer is able to analyze substances into their component parts. Here on the left is a mass spectrometer with all the associated equipment used to analyze the output here on the right. The syringe is being used to introduce a sample which needs to be analyzed. This particular sample is an organic liquid. Here you can see where all the main parts of the mass spectrometer are housed. The iron source on the left, the electromagnet in the middle, and the detector on the right. The yellow line shows the way in which a beam of ions leaves the source of the ions, curves in the vertical magnetic field, and passes on to the detector. The output from the detector is displayed on a screen. You will notice two or three peaks here clearly displayed. These can be enhanced by a computer like this. Let's now look at the mass spectrometer in more detail. Here on the left is where the sample is ionized. Now this is known as the source. And it's shown here being removed from its housing. Samples can vary enormously in type and may be elements, mixtures or compounds. And their state may be solid, liquid or gaseous. So the source has to be capable of producing ions from these many different types of sample which may need to be analyzed. You can see here the source fully removed and upright so that it can be seen in more detail. The electrodes look complex but are many and varied in order that the different types of sample can be handled and analyzed. In the middle of the apparatus is the iron block which you can see here highlighted. This is where the ionization actually takes place and is a type of ionization chamber. Here is another view where on the left we are showing another separated iron block. Let's now look in detail to see how it works. Electrons emitted by a hot filament located here travel across the iron block by passing through the exit slot to the top positive plate. As they cross, the electrons shown in blue strike molecules of the sample so ionizing them. Positive ions, shown here in yellow, are created. They are repelled at right angles to the direction of the electron flow and attracted towards a negative electrode, or cathode, further along the apparatus. You can see the positive repeller plate highlighted here beneath the electron beam. The iron block, of course, is normally at right angles to this when the source is inserted into its housing. So the iron beam actually travels horizontally along the tube towards the cathode. The iron block and cathode are approximately in this position when the source is housed within the mass spectrometer. The high voltage V between the repeller in the iron block and the cathode accelerates the positive ions to high velocity. These ions travel on towards the vertical magnetic field of the electromagnet where they are deflected towards the detector. Some ions of a given mass and speed are deflected by the magnetic field by just the right amount to enter the detector. On the other hand, some ions are not deflected enough, while others are deflected too much. In practice, either the magnetic field B or the accelerating voltage V is changed repeatedly to scan the iron beam across the detector, as we shall be seeing later. The detector in this case is an electron multiplier. Here it is, removed from the mass spectrometer tube. It contains a number of thin metal electrodes known as dynodes. If you count them, you'll find that there are 17 in this case. The small numbers of ions hitting the first dynode at the front end of the detector eject secondary electrons. Each of these electrons ejects many further secondary electrons at the next dynode. Hence, an ever-increasing number of electrons are ejected at each of the 17 dynodes. The resulting avalanche of electrons, shown here in blue, amplifies the signal by a factor of about a million before it's passed on to the display unit. Let's look at the signal which emerges from the detector as the magnetic field is changed. 
Here, the current in the electromagnet is shown being scanned regularly from 5 to 0 amps every 3 seconds. A very wide range of ions is displayed, a much wider range than we really need. Here, a faster scanning rate over a current range of 1.8 to 1.9 amps just picks out the two iron beams we saw earlier on. In the graphic display, you can clearly see the movement of the iron beams as they are scanned by the changing magnetic field and move across the position of the detector. As the ions accelerate, the gain in kinetic energy is equal to the loss of potential energy. Hence, kinetic energy gain equals potential energy loss. Similarly, the curved path of the iron beam is due to the centripetal force caused by the magnetic field. Therefore, centripetal force equals the force produced by the magnetic field. Eliminating the velocity between these two equations gives this expression for the square of the radius. Now Q over M is a constant for a particular beam of ions. So either V or B may be changed to scan the beam across the detector. We have only seen the magnetic field B changed so far. Here, you can see the effect of changing V over a narrow range. In this case, around 3.8 kilovolts. Varying the voltage V is easier to do quickly than to change the magnetic field B by changing the current in the electromagnet's coils. This is because these coils have such a high inductance. So, for a fast scanning rate, V is varied and the current in the electromagnet's coils is kept constant. The output can be further analysed by computer enhancement methods. And this we can clearly see here. There are several peaks because of the numerous ions present. But once again, notice the two tall ones. Alternatively, instead of displaying on a screen, we can plot it out with a plotter like this. The two right-hand peaks here are due to the two isotopes of chlorine, which are two atomic masses apart, 35 and 37. It's possible to compare the output pattern with those of known compounds which are kept in the computer's library held on a computer disk. In this case, the spectrum of chlorobenzene is displayed on the left, and that of our sample on the right. The pattern is virtually identical. So, the substance we have been dealing with is now identified. It is chlorobenzene.